Welcome everyone. My name is Akasemi Newsom and I'm Associate Director of the Institute of European Studies here at the University of California, Berkeley. We're honored today to have Professor Simukai Chigudu with us today for a lecture titled, When Will We Be Free? Scenes from a Historical Memoir on Colonialism and Freedom. Now a bit about our speaker. Professor Simukai Chigudu is spending a fellowship year at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. He's an associate professor of African politics at the University of Oxford and a fellow of St. Anthony's College. His monograph, The Political Life of an Epidemic, Cholera, Crisis, and Citizenship in Zimbabwe, published by Cambridge University Press in 2020, won the prestigious Theodore J. Lowy First Book Award from the American Political Science Association. Before coming to academia, Professor Chigudu worked as a physician in the UK's National Health Service for three years. He holds an MD from Newcastle University, an MPH from Imperial College London, and a DPhil in International Development from the University of Oxford. And Professor Chigudu will lecture for about 30 to 40, 35 to 40 minutes, and then I'll be happy to moderate questions from our virtual audience as well as our in-person uh, community. Please do join me in welcoming Professor Chigudu to UC Berkeley. Thank you. So I just want to say thank you for that very generous uh, introduction and for this invitation. It really is a delight uh, to be at Berkeley, um, a place for a number of reasons that's dear to my heart, and I'm delighted to share a bit of work from my, my forthcoming book with you. Um, I should stress that this is very much a work in progress, um, and I still have more of the book to write than I have written, but hopefully something will, will cohere this afternoon. So... Every work of literature has both a situation and a story, writes the critic Vivian Gornick. The situation, Gornick explains, is the context or the circumstance, sometimes plot. The story is the emotional experience that preoccupies the writer. It's the insight, the wisdom, the thing one has come to say. I first thought about writing a book of narrative nonfiction during the anti-racist uprisings of 2020. The public mood in Britain was one of reckoning with its colonial past. And as a keen participant in activist movements to decolonize public history, and as one of the few black professors at the University of Oxford, there are about 11 of us out of nearly 2000, I believed I had something to say. I want to tell an epic story about colonialism and its aftermath with my family at the center of it. I wanted to write about the land stolen from my ancestors in what is today called Zimbabwe, about my parents' involvement in the liberation wars against settler colonialism in Southern Africa, about the promise and frustrated hopes of African independence, about Britain's whitewashing of colonial history. I saw this backdrop as crucial to our understanding of how the colonial past incurs on the, on the present and what it might mean to decolonize to be finally free from the legacies of empire. And I do pursue these themes in my book, When Will We Be Free? But as I've discovered, they are not the story, they are the situation. In the course of research and writing, I've discovered that the story is something altogether more complicated and submerged, that the freedom I'm seeking is intensely personal. As Akasemi said in her generous introduction, I've spent the last year at Stanford as a, as, a, as a fellow at CASBIS. And in this time, I've used my fellowship year to reimagine the structure of my book, to think again about the deep questions driving it and the revelations I've been working towards. And so at the moment, the revised and working structure of my book is as follows. The book opens with a prologue, and it's then divided into four different parts. And each of these parts then be further subdivided into chapters. The parts are innocence, inheritance, crisis, reckoning. They're going to unfold in a non-linear chronology and conclude with a coda. Today, I'm going to share a chapter with you from part two of the book, Inheritance, 
Now, part two of the book is the section of the book that, that details my parents' backstory. It talks about their early lives and their coming of age. It situates them within the traumatic, within their traumatic experience of Africa's struggles for liberation and early post-colonial civil wars. Through interviewing and writing about my parents, I've become increasingly aware of the factual nature of the violence of colonial rule and the difficulties with confronting its aftermath. Those terrible omissions in our public reckoning with the ugly sides of history recur in myriad and unexpected ways in terrible omissions in my parents' oral testimonies about their lives. Both my parents have come to discover carry with them the pain of loss and of dispossession. Their wounds are too often raw and untended, and this leads them into an intractable grief um, about the past, about Zimbabwe's, an intractable form of denial, I should say, about grief from the past, about Zimbabwe's post-colonial trajectory, and about their own uncomfortable feelings of guilt, uncertainty, and shame. So I've been working through this complicated familial inheritance on the page and in therapy, and this has necessarily been a slow and patient process. And it's become clearer and clearer to me that a guiding thread in this book is not only a scholarly one, but it's also an interrogation into intergenerational trauma. And so the book is now taking shape as a story that is simultaneously about collective freedom from the afterlives of colonialism and freedom of the self from the fractious despair of a troubled family. These themes are woven together intricately like the strands of a double helix, inseparable without being reducible to each other. So with that introduction, I'm now going to share uh, just one chapter um, and that recounts my father's early life and the world that he was born into. My father's father belonged to the social class called migrant laborers. In the early 20th century, when black labor in Southern Africa was forced to a cheap and resembled bondage or modern slavery, black men migrated for work throughout the region. There is something dissatisfying, something sanitized and concealing about the word migrated in this context. It doesn't quite capture the ceaseless rotation of black workers shipped like cargo in the boxcars of steam-driven locomotives to toil in the mines of South Africa. It doesn't capture the backbreaking labor, the digging and the drilling deep down in the belly of the earth for shiny evasive stones before drying at atrocious rates from tuberculosis. It doesn't capture the exhausting tedium of picking tomatoes or cotton or fruit or tobacco on the plantations of white owned farms under the scornful glare of the white foreman and under the scorching glare of a white hot sun. Mm -hmm. It doesn't capture the smell of unwashed bodies and untended festering wounds in the overcrowded workers' barracks. It doesn't capture the loneliness of separation from lovers and children. My grandfather was one of the luckier ones. He started working when he was about nine years old, but that was as a domestic worker on a farm in southern Rhodesia. They called him a houseboy, a term for a black male of any age working as a factotum for a white employer. Racism has a habit of treating children as adults and adults as children. Still, for all its indignities, the life of a houseboy was less punishing than life on the mines or on the plantation. In 1919, as a young man, my grandfather left Southern Rhodesia um, uh, for the Union of South Africa. He worked in Kimberley, Port Elizabeth, Johannesburg, Cape Town, before returning to South, Southern Rhodesia's capital, where his South African work credentials gained him employment as a waiter and cook in the city's finest hotels. Now, perhaps it goes without saying, but these hotels only serve white people. It was during this stint that he was granted living quarters, a dingy bungalow in a Black-only township on the outskirts of Salisbury. These were houses designated for migrant laborers who moved from their rural homes to work in the city. From time to time, my father, my grandmother, and my father's older siblings would cram themselves into this house to stay with my grandfather for weekends. The family lost that house when my grandfather was arrested in 1965, but my father still speaks of it in the honeyed tone, in honeyed tones when he laments the seven links of the past. The home my father remembers most clearly was his family's rural house. 
a brick and iron structure in an arid village surrounded by vast open woodlands and grimy sasa trees. The family had been forcibly moved there by the Rhodesian government in 1947, four years before my father was born. Now, across southern Rhodesia, the colonial government had confiscated the country's most fertile terrain. They dispossessed black people and gave their land to white settlers who established ranches and large commercial farms. The evicted black people were confined to so-called tribal trust lands. While my father was born after the eviction, he inherited his family's mournful attachment to the home he never knew and his family's fearsome disdain for the government that displaced them. The Africa of my father's childhood teetered on the fulcrum of historical change. He was five years old when the first sub-Saharan African nation gained independence from colonial rule at midnight on March 6, 1957. Wearing a white skull cap, Kwame Nkrumah mounted a small wooden platform to address a large ululating crowd in a South Parliament Square. And at the dazzle of floodlights with tears streaming down his face, Nkrumah announced that the, that the independence of the Gold Coast renamed Ghana in homage to the ancient West African Empire. The Union flag was lowered and a new flag of red, green, and gold was hoisted in its place. The moment of freedom had arrived, Nkrumah declared. 1957 marked the birth of a new Africa, ready to fight its own battles and show that after all, the black man is capable of managing his own affairs. It had taken a decade of strikes, boycotts, and civil disobedience for Ghana to gain independence. But this was only one battle in the war for African emancipation. Our independence, Kuma said, is meaningless unless it is linked up with the total liberation of the African continent. To be sure, in North Africa, decolonization was already underway. The previous year had seen Sudan, Morocco, and Tunisia acquire independence while a war for independence was already raging in Algeria. But the independence of Ghana, only the fourth black nation state in the world after Haiti, Liberia, and Ethiopia, was a signal event in the Black Atlantic. Nkrumah's audience that night included Martin Luther King Jr. and his wife, Coretta Scott King. Nationalists from across the continent, like Julius Nyerere of Tanzania, also participated in the Independence Day celebration. Barred from traveling to Ghana because the United States government had revoked his passport, the African-American intellectual and civil rights activist W.E.B. Du Bois wrote a public letter to Nkrumah and the Ghanaian people congratulating them on a hard-won independence and encouraging the new country to don the mantle of the pan-Africanist movement that he had helped to foster since the turn of the 20th century. Ghana's independence arrived mere months after the year-long boycott of the public transit system by African Americans in Montgomery, Alabama. For the likes of Du Bois and King, the efforts of maids and gardeners in Montgomery to walk miles in heat and rain, singing We Shall Overcome, despite intimidation and harassment, was contiguous with Ghanaian independence as the beginnings of a global struggle for racial equality. Captivated by Nkrumah's fiery charisma was a young Robert Mugabe, who had moved to Ghana in 1958. Mugabe attended the first All African People's Conference, a gathering of Pan-Africanist ideologues from 28 countries and colonies strategizing for freedom continent-wide. It was here that Mugabe began to think seriously about how African nationalism and Marxism could end white settler colonial rule in southern Rhodesia and bring about a new vision of society. But Mugabe was not the only one invigorated by African nationalism. So too were my grandfather and my uncle Tine, nine years my father's senior. By the early 60s, both men, my grandfather and my uncle, had joined the leading national party at the time, the Zimbabwe African People's Union, or ZAPU. Tine went a step further and joined ZAPU's military wing. His was a steely determination to take down the Rhodesian government by any means necessary. The white minority governments of Southern Africa had other ideas. As the first wave of decolonization swept through Africa, the European settler populations of South Africa, Southwest Africa, Rhodesia, and the Lusophone colonies of Angola and Mozambique all tightened their control on their colonies, determined to bring African nationalism to a halt 
and to keep power and wealth in white hands. To them, African leadership orchid disaster. Meanwhile, the British government conceded that there was no stemming the tide of African independence. Prime Minister Harold Macmillan traveled to the Union of South Africa in 1960 and warned the apartheid state and its white nationalist neighbors that the wind of change is blowing through the continent. Whether we like it or not, this growth of national consciousness is a political fact. The Macmillan government and its immediate successors made the pragmatic decision to support Southern Rhodesia's independence from the British Empire on the condition of unimpeded progress to majority rule and an end to racial discrimination. Pressure on Southern Rhodesia was mounting. African protest against unfair treatment under colonial rule escalated from messy, uncoordinated campaigns into more militant nationalism, demanding one man, one vote. Now, the rising threat of violent nationalism provoked a backlash. Southern Rhodesia became Rhodesia when the government took a hard turn to the right as the white supremacist Rhodesian Front Party was elected to power. At its helm from 1964 was an unlikely hero. A politician of colorless record, a simple man, shorn of humor and emotion, a dull speaker with a limited and repetitive vocabulary, as lacking in charisma as he was in fashion sense, <laughs> an anti-intellectual who preferred cricket to books, and, as it turned out, a tactically astute and bitterly racist demagogue who personified the motto, Rhodesians never die. Ian Smith, as man in myth, represented everything my father hated. Smith and his supporters called themselves pioneers, the only true Britons left, Spartans, the last good white men standing as African as any black man, a unique breed of men whose example will go some way towards redeeming the squalid and shameful times in which we live. Their national anthem, stately and august, evoked solemnity and power in its visions of greatness, of godliness, of being on the right side of history. The Rhodesian Front felt betrayed by Britain. As they saw it, the mother country had abandoned its empires and its values and was all too ready to overlook military dictatorship and civil war in Black Africa while condemning Rhodesian society for not acceding to calls for African independence. If Churchill were alive today, Smith said, I believe he would probably emigrate to Rhodesia because I believe that all those admirable qualities and characteristics that we believed in, loved, and preached to our children no longer exist in Britain. For my father, the year 1965, when the Smith government was getting ready to break away from Britain was the most difficult time. Says my father, I was 14 years old, but I was still in primary school. That year, my father was arrested, my sister was arrested, my brother Rocha, the eldest, pictured here on, on, on your right, was arrested. Tinei, my other brother on the left of the back, had already left the country for training in North Korea. But when he came back, he too was arrested. So my uncle Tinei had gone to North Korea to learn armed infiltration and intelligence gathering in guerrilla warfare. Men like him activated the Rhodesian fear that lurking in the shadows of Europe's declining power in Africa was the insidious advance of communism. <laughs> Communists, they said, were using African nationalists as a Trojan horse to sack the colonial Troy and capture Southern Africa's vast mineral riches. The Rhodesian government harassed, imprisoned, banned African political activists in a bid to fortify Southern Africa as an impregnable bastion of white power. Tinei was identified as a terrorist by an informer, that is, an African spy working for the Rhodesian state who had infiltrated the nationalist movement. My uncle went to prison age 23 and remained in captivity for 12 years. The story my father would tell me about his own conversion from innocent child to freedom fighter has a fabulous quality about it. By this, I don't mean to say that my father is being dishonest, far from it. What I mean is that his storytelling is driven by a kind of unambiguous morality. He draws clear dividing lines. There are heroes who fight for the nation, 
and anyone who stands in the way is a villain. Whether he's conscious of it or not, my father endows his story with symbolism and revelation, with linear causality and progression to the telos of self-indication. His is as much an account of the past as it is a statement of the man he is in the present. It's the story that he wants or needs me to believe if I am ever to understand his enduring loyalties to the country and the sacrifices he's made in my name. To dwell in this story is to see the world as my father sees it or wants to see it. To dwell in this story is ultimately to see him too. And this story goes something like this. On November 11, 1965, Rhodesia unilaterally declared independence from Britain, an undertaking that the Rhodesian Front compared to the USA's Declaration of Independence some 200 years before. About three weeks later, towards the end of November, my grandfather left his village home to attend a neighbor's funeral. On the way back, my grandfather's party was ambushed. Through the help of an informer, Rhodesian police identified my grandfather as a nationalist with Zapu. They beat him up, roped him to a motorbike, and took him to a holding cell in the nearest town. My father waited home that evening for my grandfather to return. One evening turned into another, and then another, and then another. For two weeks, my father and his family heard nothing. This is life in a country at war. The fear of disaster stalks you, grabs you, sinks its claws into you, and refuses to let you go. Finally, a gray Land Rover rolled into the village. Its doors opened, letting out the familiar static of a police radio. A bevy of white police officers pulled my grandfather out of the vehicle and dumped him to the ground. Disheveled, frightened, covered in dust, my grandfather scrambled to his feet. He was told to get a few clothes from the house, chop, chop. My father saw his dad, but couldn't talk to him. The police shoved my grandfather away as my father approached him. They bundled my grandfather back into the car, and just like that, they were gone. The entire episode exists in my father's memory as a bad dream, paradoxically ephemeral and enduring a distillation of the fear he felt at the tender age of 14. The police took my grandfather to the country's largest detention site, Gwanakudziwa, where the banished ones speak. On arrival, my grandfather was greeted by an aimless congregation of tin huts and boreholes, bounded on the east by the Mozambican border, hundreds of miles from any town, and everywhere surrounded by a dark wilderness where lions and elephants roam free. He was thrown into a small room with walls of corrugated metal. The heat was sweltering during the day. The cold was biting and bullying at night. When the rain fell, the detention site turned from the thickest of dust to the direst of mud. In 1966, my father started his secondary education at Murewa High School in the northeast of the country, founded by Methodist missionaries. My grandfather had left behind enough savings to pay school fees for my father's first year. But by 1967, as my father started his second year, the family savings ran out. There wasn't a penny left. Looking sympathetically at his situation, the missionaries allowed my father to continue his schooling if he agreed to do maintenance work around the school during the holidays. My father was bright, though wan and sensitive as a boy. His brothers put this down to him being the youngest, you know, the special child, the one indulged by his parents and coddled by his sisters. He struggled to settle into Murewa. Its strict code of conduct was designed to breed men, not boys like my father with manners like flowers. In the holiday months of April, August, and December, my father would not go home. He worked for his tuition, mixing cement or stumping trees or polishing floors, or when he was lucky, filing away paperwork. One day in August, 1968, as my father was plowing the school fields, a classmate hurried to him, eager and breathless. Edgar, the boy said, the missionary insisted on using Christian names. Your father has been released. 
My father begged for an excusal from the school to go back home and hug my grandfather. He took a bus from Murewa to the township nearest to home. He walked briskly from the bus stop, then sped up into a light jog before breaking into a full stride sprint as the house came into view. Drowning in an oversized hand-down maroon sweater and dripping with sweat, he threw his arms around, my, uh, around his father. I saw him, he saw me, we hugged each other. That was it. Tine was still in prison and the other siblings had scattered around the country. My father was the only one of his parents' children there to welcome my grandfather back from detention. My father stayed home for the next three days, one day for each year that my grandfather had been in prison before he returned to the school to resume his manual work. What happened in those few days together? What did my grandfather say about his detention? What did he convey to my father, just a boy, about the unfolding battles in the country? I have no picture of my grandfather's inner life. He is as mythical to me as the downtrodden Israelites of the Old Testament. As for my father, there is something potent, something torrid, if all, if elusive, in his recollection of this time. I can almost feel in myself all his anger, compassion, sorrow, failure, disgust, resentment, betrayal, and love, all surging and crashing like waves within him. The man I grew up with was not one to give himself over to his feelings. And so I tried to imagine him back then, barely 17 years old, lost and frightened in a hard country. If he felt vulnerable or confused, this is not what he wished to tell me. Instead, he speaks of this moment of existential terror as a Damascene turning point when his internal tumult hardened into political conviction. Back at school, my father came into his own. He won a scholarship for academic excellence, which covered his, the cost of his tuition. He distinguished himself as a long distance runner. He became one of the most popular boys at school and he was elected chairman of the student Christian movement. Now, the greatest honor of the chair was to deliver a sermon on one Sunday of the year to the entire Methodist congregation in Murewa district. My father seized this opportunity to preach from the gospel according to Matthew. Blessed are ye, when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Now, as a matter of fact, my father held little religious conviction. He saw Christianity's arrival in Africa as a paradox. For centuries, white rulers claimed moral virtue and superior knowledge of God, and yet they dispossessed, enslaved, imprisoned, infantilized, and dehumanized fellow human beings in a way that my father could only describe as evil. But to be persecuted by the Rhodesian regime he now pronounced from the pulpit was a blessed call to arms because righteousness was on the side of the black man. My father, in that moment, he says, claiming the truth, he knew the enemy, justice was on his side. By 1971, under the spell of high fever, the Rhodesian government had detained, exiled, or silenced the most prominent African nationalists. Years of negotiation between the Brits and the Rhodes offered limited concession to majority rule. Guerrilla attacks against the Smith government grew more widespread. In the same year, my father was one of only three students from Murewa to pass his national examinations well enough to continue to his last few years of high school, which he would complete at Tegwani High School at the opposite end of the country in the Southwest. My father had only been at Tegwani for a matter of months when he says that he was summoned to a clandestine meeting down by the river behind the school. The main reason why the African people, especially the youth, can now resort to violence is because they are not allowed a word, not a word in politics, said a young man, a guerrilla soldier there to recruit the boys of Tegwani into a demonstration against the Smith government. In a country of 6 million, white people who made up less than 5% of the population outnumbered black people 20 to 1 in all political representation. The few black people in politics were chiefs on the payroll of the Rhodesian government. 
they would condemn this puppet or sell out by the nationalists. My father listened intently at the river meeting, where a plan was formulated to seize the attention of a diplomatic British delegation in Rhodesia. Lord Goodman and his team had arrived in the rebel colony to meet with Smith's representatives about war concessions toward majority rule. This is our message, said the soldier at the river. If the British government and the British people still want some friendship with the African people in this country, they must see that they satisfy it by helping to give in freedom. My father nodded along as the speech continued. The only way to reason with Smith is to use violence. That is violence in the valley. And the Africans, we will do it because the British government has refused to use violence. Maybe tomorrow I'll be behind bars and I don't mind. I am prepared to make such sacrifices and even greater sacrifices for the freedom of the country. Are you? Teguani was among three schools where boys were rallied to demonstrate against racial discrimination. My father and his comrades left the school at 3 a.m. and marched the eight miles to the nearest town, Plumtree. They held defiant placards that read, Zimbabwe will be free. Within moments of entering the city, lots of policemen descended upon them like torrential rain. Parking police dogs, vicious German shepherds, surrounded the protesters in a wide cordon and the police threw tear gas canisters into the crowd. My father and a hundred other screaming boys were rounded up into police cars and taken to court. He was sentenced to corporal punishment. My father spent the next night in prison, stuffed into a cell with 18 other boys. He couldn't sleep, uncertain and fearful about the next day's punishment. In the morning, as the dawn's pale sunlight peered through the cell's high window to soften the shock of darkness, the boys began to stir. The punishment would commence soon. One prisoner climbed on the shoulders of another, and the pair leaned against the wall, edging their way to the window. The lookout on top examined the courtyard scene below to gauge what awaited them. He shouted to everyone's relief. Not so bad. He was wrong. My father was summoned from the cell and taken to a holding room with another prisoner. There, the police stripped both boys naked. A prison guard wrapped itchy, threadbare cloths over their bare midriffs and buttocks. At that moment, a banshee cried from the courtyard, high-pitched and blood-curdling stamp the air. My father remembers this grotesque sound. The first round of flogging had been delivered by the police, but as my father was preparing for his beating, a helicopter landed near the prison yard. It delivered what he called the professionals. It's his own sinister and cynical code word for the men who apparently specialized in taming prisoners. When it was his turn, a prison guard led my father out of the holding room through the courtyard, through the courtyard to a large trapezium-shaped table made of heavy sun-bleached wood. Bend over and spread out, the prison guard said. My father prostrated his upper half over the table with his limbs splayed out like a starfish. The prison guard tied him down with disturbingly meticulous care. You're going to count for me, Kappa, said the professional. One, my father croaked his voice husky with vulnerability. The whip sliced across his bottom. Ah! The air vacated his lungs. His chest tightened. A tingling sensation coursed up and down his spine. Sweat ran over his body like a colony of ants. A percussive sound pounded in his ear. I said you're going to fucking count for me, Kappa. The word too barely escaped my father's lips when the whip sliced across his buttocks again. Rivers of sweat and rivers of blood poured in confluence down his leg. By the fifth whipping, my father was delirious. His voice had muted. 
his vision blurred, the color in his skin drained away. Fuck, he muttered under his breath. After the final whipping, a prison guard untied my father's limp body. Once free, my father jolted back to life, and with a burst of energy, he ran. He bolted to a tap at the other end of the courtyard. He wanted water. In a flash, the professional who had whipped him emerged from the crowd and stared my father down. My father looked into those dull and beautiful eyes and froze dead in his tracks. There would be no water for him. My father trundled back to the prison cell, helpless, humiliated, and so parched he felt he might choke on clumps of dry air. The prisoners were discharged later that day and Paul to walk eight miles back to Teguani. I've never experienced such a thing, my father recalled, still wincing at the memory decades later. And I, listening to him, felt numb. My father's rear was so lacerated, he would have to sit on his thighs for the next two weeks. The walk itself was torture. Now, a saving grace was that the school's principal, a white British man, had returned to the UK for some ceremonial occasion at Cambridge University. His deputy, a black man called Kumalo, was left in charge. Kumalo supported the nationalist cause. He sent a lorry to pick up the boys once they were at a sufficiently safe distance from the prison. The lorry came full of piping hot food and cold water. We ate like baboons, my father says. It was heaven's food. Thank you very much. <laughs>